Last year, an amateur archaeologist was walking through these woods when he came across a load of lumps and bumps, and they were very lumpy and bumpy. He was told that this site played a crucial role in the defence of this island during the Second World War, and he realised that it needed to be looked at before it was lost forever. So he talked to Time Team about it, and they said that no one has ever dug a site like this before, because although this is British soil, these defences aren't British. They're German, part of the vast complex of defences built by Hitler to turn Jersey into an island fortress. Oh, and by the way, that amateur archaeologist was me. So I'm going to be under quite a lot of pressure over the next few days. 70 years later, the islands are littered with the remains of that occupation. During the occupation period, 40 to 45, we're talking about some 65,000 plus mines being laid in the island and probably over 26,000 tonnes of other munitions. And it means for the next three days, our archaeologists are going to have to be rather careful when it comes to any small finds they uncover. So, are you still happy to go ahead with this? I think I feel slightly more cautious than that, I think. <laughs> so, with the briefing over, it's time to get our first trench in. Now, you say, don't hit it hard, and then the first thing you do is you go... And it's essential we're vigilant, because our site at Les Gillette is a heavily fortified German anti-aircraft battery that overlooked the airport and dominated the surrounding landscape. Now hidden under a canopy of trees, this rare wartime RAF reconnaissance photograph shows the site in its prime, and it suggests it once dripped with heavy artillery. We're seeing a lot more than on that air photo, yeah. Yeah. which must be yeah. a real testament to the German camouflage guys. And we've assembled our own army of experts to decipher all these lumps and bumps. So, with GFIs somewhat kiboshed by the vegetation, we're going for the old-fashioned approach. Our first trench over a possible gun emplacement has gone in based on the aerial photograph and Stuart's surveying skills. And he's already given us a position for a second trench. There's a whole series of structures here that look as if they're buildings associated with the emplacement that Phil's working on. In spite of being only 70 years old, we haven't been able to find any written records for this site. They were probably destroyed by the Germans before they surrendered. Oh, I think you've got it precisely what we had before. But these 20 millimetre diameter shells do suggest that Trench 1 is the site of a 20 mil anti-aircraft gun. And this gun would have been just one of thousands of German weapons that swamped Jersey from 1940 onwards. We've also now opened two more trenches, this time over strange features that John's managed to identify from his severely curtailed geophys. Ah, lovely. And one of them has just thrown up a find that's got us completely stumped. Wondered whether it was part of a field kitchen, but... That's not going to work for filling it full of uh, soup, is it? So It looks too fragile for something like a gun mounting, doesn't it? Doesn't it just? Well, there's our first mystery on this site. <sighs> yeah. We have two days now, left to find out what that is. And people say, why do you bother digging it? You know what everything is. But we have sorted out Trench 1. Yeah. It's not just a bank that's thrown up to go round a gun. The defense... As Phil's discovered that the defences built on this hillside were engineered to last. What we seem to get is this, this inner stone-built revetment, and then we've got this fine-grained material pushed against the outside of it to make the actual bank. I mean, that makes complete sense. You don't want enemy shell fire or bullets striking stones. So you put the soft stuff out there and that will absorb the energy of incoming um, ammunition from the enemy. So our first trench can confirm that this earthwork is a 20 millimetre gun emplacement and it was strategically placed to shoot down low-flying aircraft. Phil's emplacement up on the top here, on the highest point, that's a 20mm gun. That's designed to be quick moving. It's got a rapid rate of fire. And as we know this shape is a 20mm gun, we can confidently say that all these features are also 20mm guns, which isn't a bad result for one day's digging. These larger 88mm gun pits will be our main target for tomorrow as we begin to extend our investigation. 
because it's now clear that this whole hillside operated as one big settlement. So far, we've only been digging about a third of this battery, and Stuart feels it's about time to investigate another target at the other end of the site. You know, from other flat batteries, you know what to expect. There's a gun, and then there has to be a, a fire and command control centre close to the guns, and sometimes have a shelter for the crew underneath, like a bunker or something like that. Not necessarily concrete, could be dug down into yeah. the rock or the earth. Well, I mean, the results don't necessarily suggest concrete bunker, but certainly something that's going deep into the ground and appears to have collapsed and be full of rubble. Mm. That's hard ground, isn't it? So we're opening a new trench over a potential bunker, and very quickly it becomes clear there's something rather interesting deep down. Look at this red here. There's some tile. Oh, right, it's a tile, isn't it? A brick. And then we discover the last thing we need. Ian, I think that's perhaps where we stop, because I think we've got some form of ordnance going on. And this time it's not a stray bullet. It looks like a very real, very live artillery shell. Hi. These rock-cut trenches would appear to show the determination of the German troops here to defend their positions against Allied attack. But there could be a chance that the soldiers didn't do the digging themselves. Because our site overlooks the most impressive and most chilling monument to the German occupation. About 100 feet above my head, Phil and the rest of the team are excavating our German anti-aircraft battery. But down here, there's a much more tangible example of the German occupation. This is the Jersey War Tunnels, originally created as an artillery workshop and military hospital for the Germans. But if ever there's a statement that says, we're powerful, we're here, and we're not going away, this is it. Hewn out of solid rock, the tunnels are a testament to German engineering. But they're also a testimonial to the brutal Nazi ethos that some people deserved to be treated as subhuman. There is something phenomenally bleak about that unfinished tunnel, isn't there? There is. It was built by people who worked for the organisation TOTE. And these were voluntary labour, there's um, coerced labour, forced labour, slave labour. People from from Russia, from Poland, from Belarus, from Ukraine. People who in the, the Nazi racial hierarchy were right down there. Did many of them die? Yes, yes, hundreds in, uh, in Alderney and um, around about 100 in Jersey. It's a sobering reminder as we reach the end of day two that what we're digging had a real and lasting impact on the people of Jersey. Stuart, this turned up earlier. And we're still discovering yet more evidence of the force used to occupy this island. Well, it's an 88 shell case, that's for sure. Well, I think the, the actual gain for the, uh, the primer of the shell case is still present, so uh, it's potentially dangerous. Back at the heart of the site, the scale of the gun emplacements that fired those shells is now evident. That looks a bit like a firing step there. Well, that's what we think. Um, this one's different to all these other shelters in that it's got that out there. Now, if you, if you look through, actually what you've got is a field of fire down that trench system and covering that area out in the woodland beyond. So it makes sense to have a sort of secondary defence line here. Defending this hill from a land-based attack appears to have become more important in the latter years of the war, and we're now confident another one of our trenches is also part of this re-fortification. It's a machine gun post. Heck of a lot of hard work. You can see it was cut out of the solid rock, and it's part of the network of defences that we can see pretty clearly on the 1944 aerial photo. But intriguingly, we're starting to find things that aren't on that photo, like this big structure behind you, Martin. What is it? Right, well, it begins life. You can see it on there. It's the same sort of position as that first trench fill did. But they've dished in one side of it here to create this big bank there. So it's stopped being about anti-aircraft defence, and actually it's become part of this system, and it's providing extra fire support for the guys who are down there in your machine gun. So it's a shifting from attack to defence? Quite right, yes. How does that tie in with history? Well, 
this photo was taken in August, I think, 1944. And if you think June 1944, everything has changed because you've had the Allied landings in Normandy. So suddenly the Allies, they're, they're only 14 miles away in France. So it's a completely different game they're suddenly having to play here. They are now cut off not just from Britain, they're also cut off from France. So the irony is that the Germans here who were the besiegers had now suddenly become the besieged. Completely. So, so we always think of D-Day as this big moment when the war turned, but things just got worse for everybody here. We can now concentrate on working out what we've actually uncovered on site. And it's clear that by the end of the war, the Germans had built a sophisticated complex of trenches against ground attack. I just can't believe how big this thing is. Meanwhile, Rakshar and Phil, fresh from the beach, have revealed an 88mm emplacement as robust as any Roman archaeology we've ever uncovered. We've got that little bunker area over there. We can actually see now where all the timber revetment is. But the main thing is, this is a seriously big piece of engineering for a seriously big gun. While over in Phase Trench, we've also got something equally robust. But this time, it's underground. Well, down at the bottom now, we've actually got the base of this structure. And what we think we've got, you see the depth of it, is something from a bunker. And we've got all these cables and wires coming in. So I think we've got a communication bunker. Could this be the brains of the whole operation? I don't think it's big enough to be the brains of the whole operation, but potentially some of it, yes. This building here is a command and control centre. That's where Faye's digging. Yes, right in that trench, trench that down trench. there, yeah. yeah. So, with all this information, what does our man in the sand pit think? Because we've excavated around 20 millimetre battery, you know what that's like? We can see others on the aerial photograph. Yep. And we've got a number of them ringing around the site. The 88 millimetre ones are square. They're very different to the 20 yep. millimetre ones. There's a, a nice triangular pattern of three there. Yep. And over in where we're standing, nice triangle geometric pattern. So, you can imagine, if they're firing, at 15 rounds a minute, that's 45 rounds from each of these batteries a minute, times two, 90 rounds a minute, these batteries can pump up into the sky. That's serious, that's serious air defence, is that. But you can see how they just went from being an anti-aircraft battery suddenly to having to think almost in infantry mode. This is the weakest side, they're expecting attacks up here, and you can see they're also, in this trench system, they're digging a trench along the back of the hedge line now, and they're going to use the hedge and the bank underneath it as part of the defences against any attack here. It, it's not just anti-aircraft. It's about controlling the airfield, and it's an anti-invasion defence at the same time. So we've got a fortified enclosure as sophisticated as any Iron Age hill fort, with six massive guns capable of throwing up a barrage of exploding shells, while 20 millimetre gun emplacements dealt with lower flying aircraft. But by the end, it was a fortress where starving troops lived in fear of invasion, and the 88 millimetre guns, including the one in Phil's trench, were now lowered to overlook the island below. Well, basically, we've got a sort of a, what I like to think of as a cross between a Roman fort and a, and a wooden box. The Roman fort bit is the bank that goes all the way around. That gives you your protection. The wooden box bit is the fact that all these edges would have been revetted with timber. And, in fact, when you'd have come in here, you'd have seen wooden sides and wooden flooring, and in each corner you'd have had an ammunition box there and an ammunition box there and probably one over there. But the central part is really what strikes you. It is an enormous hole that is filled up with concrete. Yeah, and right in the middle of it, there's the one thing that's missing, which is that enormous metal killing machine. Absolutely. But you can just see the imprint of where it once stood. You've got these bolts here where it's actually been fixed to the concrete. And clearly, at the end of the war, they cut them all off except one, and then they lifted the gun away and, thank God, took it away. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 
3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Two years ago, a couple of local archaeologists stumbled on this, a vast, undiscovered earthwork hidden here in these Herefordshire woods. They thought it could be man-made, even prehistoric, but they got really excited when they discovered this aerial photo, which appears to show a large curve here in the snow, which is in this field adjacent to the forest. And they wondered if the bank and ditch there might be linked to the curve here, except the two features are 500 metres apart. If they're at opposing ends of one big structure encircling this entire hilltop, then the archaeologists believe they found one of the largest Iron Age monuments in all Britain. Dinmore Hill is a vast promontory flanked by escarpments to the north and south and surrounded on three sides by the wonderfully named River Lug. And it's the setting for a curious puzzle. But the thing is, Hill fort means almost anything. It could be about soldiers, um, it could be a communal centre, it could be a village, it could even be a large cattle corral. But of course that begs the question, is it Iron Age? Well, exactly. And that's the other thing, Tony. I mean, some of these hilltop enclosures could be up to 6,000 years old. Keith, what other information have we got about this site? Has any other archaeology been done? None. Any survey work? None. So, apart from an aerial photo and an old ditch and your assertion that it could be Iron Age, really, this dig could be about any period in history, couldn't it? Well, that's life. That's Time Team Francis. <laughs> this site feels suspiciously like the lucky dip at the archaeological fun fair. Still, Iron Age Hillfort. At least we know what we're looking for. The purpose of Hillforts is the subject of heated debate but they do at least all have one or two things in common. A set of vast earthworks in one continuous circuit, usually with a couple of entrances and some houses or storerooms inside. So if we've got one here, it shouldn't be hard to miss. Except this site is more than 40 acres. It's huge. We've got our work cut out just surveying it, which is why John's recruited a small army of geophysics boffins to lend a hand. And there's no hanging about down at the other end of the site either. It's not even 10.30 and we already seem to be opening our first trench. I haven't even finished my tea yet. So what I plan to do is go down a little bit further, see if it's looking ditch-like, right? And then I'll double up the width and we'll go back about 40 metres. 40 metres? Well, there are basically two things we've got to discover, Tony. We've got to get the ditch and then we want to go on the inside because I want to get the very inside of the hill fort, if that's what it is. We're looking for the big ditch and bank we saw on Keith's aerial photo. And as always, we need finds. Pottery, bone, metalwork, anything that might tell us what this was and when it was built. Is that going to be the back of the rampart? Yeah, it looks like a rear revetment wall, possibly. The stone underneath there we found the first tantalising signs of how this huge bank was constructed. That's nice, isn't it, laid in there? It's classic. This could be really well built. Look at There's that. another one there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this would be an indicator that it might be an Iron Age construction. Not only that, it could be an indicator that this is an entrance. Wow, Matt, so it was all colluvium. It all, yes, hidden underneath this. Yeah. There's your ditch, there it is, look. There's the... Uh, well, you can see there's the, the grey natural there, there's the line of the edge of the ditch, and then there's the fill of the ditch, the kind of blue-grey silt. Perfect. Better still, our environmental expert, Mike Allen, has got an intriguing find. Oh, look at that. That's oak, isn't it? Yeah, this is oak, and the augering did show that we might have waterlogging at the bottom of this ditch, and indeed we have, and this is, as you quite say, it's probably oak, but it's also uh, probably a stake, so a wooden stake driven into the ground, and it's now fallen into the ditch. This is more like it. We've found the giant ditch we saw on Keith's aerial photo. And it looks like it may have been defended by a palisade of sharpened stakes on the bank behind it. The archaeology in the woods is beginning to look pretty spectacular too. Wow, that's fantastic, Phil. You've got real stratigraphy. I know, it's a cracking section. 
So you've got at least three phases, possibly four. It's a very, very complicated story. Yeah. But the best, if you like, is yet to come because here's the back of the rampart. Look at these stones tipping down like that. That's the back of the rampart. And there's a, it's separated by this. It's a solid stone wall. This is great stuff. Evidence of phases indicates that whoever built this bank came back to reinforce it again and again over some considerable time. More importantly, it looks like there may have been a wooden palisade at this end of the site too. But whether these are two sections of one continuous earthwork that encircled the top of this hill, we don't yet know. And when you start to look at the physical evidence that we've got, it, it, it's very interesting. Now this is where Phil's digging just here. We can see the bank and ditch, it comes through the woodland down there, it's very well preserved, but no evidence at all of it coming round here, as you would expect with Iron Age hill forts. It doesn't happen here. And when you look at all sort of hill forts, they've all got continuity of defences around circuits. That's a very common thing. Absolutely no evidence that's ever occurred at all. What do you think it is? Well, what we've got, I think, coming across here, first of all, is something called a cross-ridge dike. Now, this is a, a sort of land boundary. This is Iron Age? Well, they can be used in the Iron Age. They often actually predate the Iron Age. It can be Bronze Age in day and continue to be used through into the Iron Age and even beyond that as boundaries. The postulation was that that was one large hill fort coming all the way around here. There's no evidence these features come back along here. If you look at the aerial photograph closely, can you see that bank and ditch, which was extant in 1946 when this photograph was taken, actually turns a corner and comes back round here. There's absolutely no evidence it continued towards the escarpment edge there. Have you told the others yet? Not yet. <laughs> you can do that for Can't me if you wait like. For that. <laughs> we may be splitting into opposing factions, but at least Phil's happy. He thinks his ditch is one of the most impressive bits of prehistoric archaeology he's ever seen. What is it that's so wonderful about this trench, then? It's just the sheer scale of being in the bottom of this ditch, and you really have to get into the bottom of it just to appreciate just how big it is. Look, when you cast your eye up there, look at the top of the rampart. Yeah. Think about a lot of this material that's in this ditch would have come from the top of that rampart. Just think of the scale of it. And this was all cut by hand? Absolutely, Tony. It all cut through this solid rock, just using people with their bare hands and, and literally uh, iron tools and picks. I mean, it's taken us half a day to do this with a machine. Just think how much longer it would have taken to do it by hand. How long do you reckon it is in either direction? In either direction, about 300 metres, so it's at 600 metres overall. And the interesting thing is it looks as though we've probably got the entrance here. Out on site, the chaos continues. Francis, this is madness. You closed that trench down this morning because it's raining so much, but you're stuck in another one. Well, the thing is, Tony, we can't just stop. We've only got three days, and I'm not having people digging these trenches. Uh, it's just being done by a machine, so there's no health and safety problems. I actually extended that other trench over there because there's a flat bit behind the bank, and that's where normally you'd expect to find houses. We didn't find any, so I then came over here, but this is a rather flat area. You can see we're in a natural hollow, and this, again, is where you'd expect to have houses, because you're protected from the winds blowing over there. And have you found anything? Nothing. Absolutely not a sausage. So are you going to keep on digging more trenches, or are you going to stop and think now? Uh, I'm going to stop and think and have a bath, I think. It's the end of day two. We've dug here, here and here but we've failed to find any evidence of people living on this hill. And yet we've got two giant earthworks. This place is still a total enigma. Back in the incident room, Mike's poring over the remains of this wooden stake from Trench 1. Painstaking microscopic work like this tells us as much about this site as the big archaeology does. The woodland isn't just a load of trees, it's a resource which they are using and utilising. So from this little piece of wood, we can suggest there's quite a complex, organised society somewhere out there managing the woodland for construction. If Mike's right, the people who built the earthwork were also coppicing trees to produce wood for fencing and cutting back trunks for bigger timbers. Back on site, there's no sign that the earthwork continued through our new trench. Phil's face says it all. Oh, I don't... This... Ian, hold on a sec. Um, well, I think we're just getting to the top of the natural there. Can you see the grey? Can you show, yeah. show exactly where we are, then? 
We've put the trench in and what we think is the break, the entrance here. Mm. This has to be a ditch. Whether it's Iron Age or not, that's up to you. Mm. If we can complete the circuit, we'll have proved beyond reasonable doubt this was an Iron Age hill fort. With just five minutes left, we haven't got long. Really? The issue is whether this is actual, real edge. Uh, it could be. There was... No, it's not. Is it collapsed? Oh, hang on, no, that is. Is that hard? That's real. OK. That's it. That's the edge there. It's six yeah. o'clock. It's, it's been really tough, easy. wet and muddy, but our time's up. Oh, you got something. Yeah, well, the geophysics showed this huge ditch coming along here yeah. with a break in it just in front of me. And that's what we've got. I'm standing in the terminus of it here at the end, and you can see it's massive cut straight through the bedrock. Do you think that this ditch aligns with the other ditch that you were digging down there yesterday? Yeah, it does. We've clearly got it on the geophysics going straight through this field and then curving off around there. Francis, it's been a sight all about ditches. It has, Tony, and what? ditches. I mean, over there in the wood, that sensational deep ditch and the bank that went with it, typically Iron Age, and the way that all the ditches we've looked at are subtly different suggests to me that they were probably dug by different groups of people who came to this area as a sort of central meeting place. Think of it as a sort of Iron Age Stonehenge. It's where people came to meet. At last, we've got confirmation of a single giant earthwork. But this was no ordinary hill fort. A radiocarbon date from our final trench indicates that its earliest phase was built 3,000 years ago in the Late Bronze Age. So although Stuart's vision of a cross-ridge dike wasn't right, his instincts were spot on. We think the western section was reinforced a 1,000 years later in the Iron Age to form a grand entrance, the gateway into a giant assembly area where surrounding communities gathered to perform religious rites and celebrate seasonal festivals. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. In my hand is a piece of Roman brick. It's not very smart. We've probably seen hundreds of bits of brick like this before, except when you turn it over, you can see that nearly 2,000 years ago, someone scrawled a list of names in it. They were probably some of the thousand or so soldiers who were stationed here at Venovia, one of the largest Roman forts in Northern England. So we're stepping outside the fort's imposing ramparts to uncover the lost world of Vinovia's Vicus. The bars, the shops, and beyond them, the cemeteries, which would have been such an essential part of life and death for Vincentus and co. We've never had the opportunity to dig an entire Vicus before, probably because it's such a massive undertaking. And we've got just three days to do it. Vinovia, or Binchester as it's known today, lies on Deer Street, the major Roman road that ran from York through Hadrian's Wall to the far north of the Empire. This strategic route was lined with forts, the backbone of the Roman military presence in Britain. And the one at Vinovia is a fantastic excavated example. It's a classic layout of barracks for up to a thousand men, kitchens and stables, and a commandant's house, complete with a luxurious bathhouse. All surrounded by a massive stone wall. And beyond that wall was the Vicus, the civilian settlement on which the fort depended. But so far, archaeologists have almost completely ignored it. There have been loads of people digging inside the fort, but actually only one person has ever had a look outside in the Vicus area. It's this chap, the Reverend Hoople, in 1891, and he produced this very interesting plan of buildings here, and we've got sketches of what he found. Now, these are really substantial bits of masonry, lots of different faces. They do look like illustrations in a late 19th century children's book, don't they? And we have been ripped off by antiquarians before who've come up with all these fantasies which you actually can't substantiate. Is yeah. this stuff real? Well, we've got something that can help us decide because look oh, at that wow. aerial photo. Yeah. I mean, this is sensational. Here we've got Deer Street and look, 
what looks exactly like these buildings very clearly here. I mean, you can even see it. that looks like the long building there. I mean, it just looks wonderful. It looks like this is a really accurate plan. So if you just go around the outside, um, then we'll just crisscross it with, uh, with the lines cut into curves about that. So we're opening our first trench over the area dug by Hoople in the 19th century. And it should contain substantial stone buildings belonging to the Vicus. But all this area, including the fort, is a scheduled ancient monument, and that means our digging options here are very limited. The entire area on that side of this fence is scheduled, so we can only put in one trench there. But given how big that fort was, we think the Vicus might extend over here, which is unscheduled, where we can put in as many trenches as we like if we get the evidence. Stu, any joy so far? Well, this field looks rather interesting, Tony, because we've got some aerial photographs. There's the fort, that's the fence you've just walked along. Can you see that? angle there, that looks like it might be an annex, a ditch feature or something, an annex onto the fort, either that or it's even a, a remnant of an earlier fort or something of that sort of order. And there's another aerial photograph which shows a road coming out of the entrance to the fort heading over that way, so yeah, there's a possibility of lots in here. And almost immediately we've got our first find. Roman. Our first piece of Samian. While Phil works his way through the plough soil, our resident historian has been casting his somewhat sceptical eyes over our geophys. Well, look, I don't think it's a temple, oh. because a Romano-Celtic temple wouldn't normally turn up here, that, which is that kind of shape. I think it's much more likely to be a mausoleum. Why do you say that? Well, it reminds me of a mausoleum just outside Rome on the Appian Way, which consists of an enclosure wall and then with a central tomb in the middle. So what's the difference between a temple and a mausoleum? A mausoleum is a place that's dedicated to the memory of a deceased person. You might actually worship there religiously. You know, you'd go and perhaps um, offer sacrifices to the spirits of your departed. But I'd guess, I'd guess, that that's more likely to turn out to be the mausoleum of maybe a commanding officer of this fort. Well, finding the last resting place of a Roman commander doesn't happen every day. And I have to admit, the geophysics results are some of the most striking we've ever seen on Time Team. So, with a strong sense of anticipation, we open our third trench over what looks like one of the walls of our possible mausoleum. That's almost exactly the line of the wall where that sheep track is. We'll hold you to that. <laughs> you know what I said? Almost exactly. Ah, almost exactly. Yeah. I've never known a sheep walk in a straight line. No. <laughs> a bit like yourself, isn't it? Yeah, after the beer. After a few beers, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We put this rather long trench in here because earlier today John did some geophys here and he came up with two things which look suspiciously like ditches. Naomi, can I come in your trench? Of course you can. Yeah. This is the edge of one of our ditches. This is the ditch fill. OK, and if we come this way... Yeah. ..where this lighter patch is, this is our other edge, so it's quite a wide ditch. That is a heck of a big ditch, isn't it? Yeah. What's that there? Well, here is just something we're just uncovering. It looks like a nice piece of mortaria. Which is? Which is kind of like a, a pestle and mortar for grinding food. And this stuff here? Again, just another nice, chunky vessel. Both Where's Roman? There? It's definitely looking that way. So does that mean that we can date this ditch as Roman? I should say so, yeah. I've built up the basic topography of the landscape as it is now. And on top of it, I've dropped up what would have been the fort. And the first thing you'll notice is half the fort's hanging off the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is a very good reason for that, because this side of the fort has actually slipped away. There's been a big landslip on this side here by the river, and it literally has, has gone. So it looks rather nice, but you're going to have to lose that, that side of it. Okay. But what that illustrates really well is this high ground that the fort sits on because it actually sits on effectively a raised island doesn't it the river on one side the valley down here that's a really dramatic piece of topography for dominating this major crossing of the river here very distinctive so we extend trench two into the area we hope's an early fort and continue to excavate our possible mausoleum trench we've now uncovered this fantastic wall and we need to work out how it relates to our potential cremation urn. So that's cleaning up really nicely now, isn't it? With that, that should be the inner face, according to the geophys, of whatever we've got here. I'll take your word for that. 
<laughs> With not one, but two discoveries of potentially national significance, our hunt for the Vicus takes a back seat. With only Matt left scraping away in search of the substantial stone buildings recorded in the 19th century. Matt, we've got a mausoleum down there. We've got cremation burials. We've got a brand new Roman fort that no one's ever seen before. What have you got in your trip? Well, apart from all this stone rubble, we've got hope. And we've got a day and a half as well, so we'll see how it goes. The mausoleum alone would be a major discovery, but we also think we might have discovered a huge earlier fort. We know the fort that's visible today was built around 130 AD. So to prove this one's earlier, we need datable evidence. So now you've got some decent edges to the ditch, you can get down into it now, I suppose. Yeah, it'd be nice to see how deep this goes now. I reckon it's going to actually come a fair old way down. I hope uh, so. <laughs> have you got anything coming out of it? Yeah, we've got some nice bits. Um, there's this lovely Samian bowl. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? You've got a date on that. Late first, early second century. Back at the and you're not, the site, you're, well, you're nowhere the near the bottom of the, of the ditch. So if we get in first century stuff evidence. this far up, makes you wonder what you got from lower down. It's a promising start. These late first century finds take us back before the construction of the stone fort in around 130 AD. But there's no dating evidence in our first trench. In fact, despite Matt's earlier optimism, there's little sign of the stone buildings we'd expected to find. So have you sorted this out now, Matt? Yep. We've got it. That is the bottom of Hoopel's trench, finally. Right. You can see, though, that there's none of this lovely masonry left. And we know that's the bottom of his trench because, look, the most exciting find of Trench 1 so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's not Roman, is it, at all? You're getting good at this, aren't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bit of 19th century willow pattern. And that was from right... Well, it's from down there in the, in the backfield, so that's confirmed that it's Victorian. So, once he'd done those nice drawings of all that nice masonry, somebody must have pinched the stonework, in fact. This is the first row of mausoleums to be found in Britain for 150 years, and only the second ever to be discovered. It's a find of national significance. Towards the end of the day, John started to get really excited about an area over here where he found this mysterious circular thing. So, Phil, have we found our mysterious circular feature? We have, but it's not circular, it's square. <laughs> this is it. You've got that straight edge there, and there's another straight edge there. Yeah. I think you could interpret that as a square mausoleum. As a mausoleum for a very small person or a pet? No, not at all. I mean, it's perfectly feasible to have a cremation in there, and you can actually get a burial in there. I mean, when you look at the size of Ian against that, the inside thing, you could actually squeeze a human body in there and get it in there, no problem. So there could still be a burial there? There could well be a burial in there. Bridge, it's a nice piece of masonry over there. Yeah, I'm glad you noticed it. It is indeed. It looks to be part of um, a column. You see this curved edge around here? That would have been the front of it. Why is it flat on the other side? Well, it's really been put up for aesthetic reasons rather than structural. So, of course, as it was standing there, this flat side would have been flush against the wall of the mausoleum, and then you would have just seen that curved column on the front, so there was no need to actually build a round column. Yeah, but this is only half the story, isn't it? You've got something fairly small over there, but you've got this massive building here. You've got a wall there, a return there, a wall there, a return there. It's huge. Ah, but you see, you're taking the obvious interpretation, which was exactly the interpretation that I came to when I first came here, and thinking that you did have this one big building. But you see, what we've got on the geophysics is this, which actually contradicts that, that there's going to be a wall across there, literally going across there, and we have no archaeological evidence for it. So we're going to continue digging for the wall that Geophys says is here, while extending our trench to see if these two outer walls do join up. The truth is, it's mid-afternoon on day three, and the layout of the mausolea is still a puzzle. Ray San and Guy are looking at possible models. Guy suspects each mausoleum was made up of a central chamber surrounded by a walled enclosure. But to confirm this, we need to find all four walls. Oh! That's it, it's it there, isn't it? Yeah. There, look, there's, there it is, it's pea grits. 
has been a truly remarkable dig. We came to this hill in search of a vicus, the civilian settlement that supported the Roman fort, and in the process we uncovered an entire lost landscape. We located the vicus along the road on either side of the fort, but we also discovered a huge earlier fort, which pushes the history of Venovia back to the very beginning of Roman occupation in the north, and a row of three mausolea, the first group to be discovered in Britain for 150 years. We came here in search of the living, but found a city of the dead, a street lined with grand tombs, a little piece of the Roman world in the far north of the empire and at its heart, perhaps the grandest mausoleum of all. OK, Antonius, my brother and fellow comrade soldier at the mighty fort of Vinovia up there, we've come down the street of tombs to venerate the memory of our great ancestor, our great-great-grandfather, the mighty general who once acted as a soldier here, and we've come down to his tomb. Now, we've got to go through the vast, mighty door that would have once been here, pivoting there on iron, and in we come to the mausoleum area, and towering above us here, is his grave with an inscription that records his name, his mighty exploits, and around here, other graves of his brother and his cousins, other members of the family. And these are the men who make you and me important people in the fort today. And our great hope one day is that we'll be buried here too. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon, gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.